Good morning and a very happy new year to you all. I'm Maureen, I'm a member of Clarence Park Baptist Church and together with my husband Peter we are taking the service this morning. This will be a communion service so if you want to take part maybe you should get some bread, crackers, juice, whatever you usually use for communion. But you're very welcome all of you to join us today. It's unfortunate that on this first Sunday of the new year we have to be, have a virtual service and we can't meet together as we would like to do. But we know wherever you are and we are worshipping this morning that the Lord will be with us. I'd like to start with some words from Psalm 25 verses 4 and 5. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. We will now sing a song that thanks the Lord for the way he has guided us over the past year and will guide us into the future. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us, cheered us on our way. Let us sing together.
That really was a lovely song, wasn't it? But let's uh, bow our hearts and our minds in prayer. Let's pray. So, Father God, at the beginning of this new year, we bow before you. Thank you for your presence in the past and we look forward to trusting in you for all that is to come. Be with us now as we share together in worship, but especially now as we gather together around your table, doing as Jesus commanded, remembering him in these things. Father, receive our thanks, our praise, our adoration, our worship in his precious name. Amen. Amen. I've often said that the heart of Christian worship is to gather around the Lord's table, to simply share bread and wine as he taught us to remember Jesus and focus the centre of our faith. I suppose for me this personifies, if you like, one of those well-known scriptures, John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And it was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus gathered with the disciples to celebrate Passover, met in that upper room, and they celebrated together. And he asked us to do just the same, in the same way, to meet one with the other, whether it's just the two of us here or the many who will be gathering at different times and different places in the days, the weeks ahead, but to remember Jesus. So would you give a prayer of thanks, Maureen, please, for the bread and for the wine? Father God, we see these symbols on the table in front of us. And it just reminds us of what you did for us, that you were prepared to go to the cross, to lose your life, to save us. Father, we just thank you. And as we, together and separated, just take these symbols, let us always remember that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for each one of us. So we thank you, Lord, at this time. Amen. Amen. And we're told that Jesus took bread and he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. So if you have some bread, then just take it now and, and eat it, remembering that God came to you in Jesus to be your saviour, to be your Lord. And so we eat together. And then at the end of the, the meal, he took a glass of wine, a cup of wine, and he said, this represents my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. All of you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so we drink, so thankful, so grateful, remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a simple thing, but it draws us closer to him, draws us closer to one another, because in doing this we remember Jesus, all that he means to us, all that he is to us, and all that he will be to us in this coming year. So let's pray again together. Father, we are conscious that these are troubled times for so many people, not just here, but around the world. And we're so grateful that in the midst of those troubles, we can turn to you, knowing that you hear our prayers, 
knowing that you receive them, that you will answer them in your way, at your time, and in accordance with your will and your purpose. We pray for those who face a future with uncertainty, who are fearful of what may happen in the coming days. We pray for those who, at this moment perhaps, are so conscious that their past life has been spoiled by that disaster of somebody being taken from their family in recent days, maybe because of Covid, maybe some other reason. Wondering what the future holds for them. Father, give them your peace, your presence. Show them of your love and enable us who know you and love you and seek to serve you to be alongside them and to help them and to encourage them. We think of those who perhaps at this time live in distant places far removed from us and longing to get somewhere else. We think of refugees. We think of those living in war-torn areas. We think of those who serve in mission agencies around the world, seeking to bring solace and comfort and maybe just simply seeking to bring food, but help and assistance to other members of the human race. Father, be with such as those. Strengthen them and encourage them and enable them to trust in you for the coming days. And for ourselves as a fellowship at Clarence Park, we lay before you these coming months, this coming year. Simply pray that as we move forward into an uncertain future, that you will guide us, direct us, encourage us, build us up in our faith. And we'll be careful, Father, to give all the glory, all the honour, all the praise to the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we meet. Father, by your Spirit, empower us, we pray, and receive our thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now a carol, the Christmas carol, I suppose it is, that seems to look to the future as well. Could you announce it for us, Maureen? Yes, it's, it came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. Shall we sing together?
Today's reading is from Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4 and 12 to 17. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God and with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We've just heard some words from Colossians. There's another verse too in Colossians 4 that I'd like you to hear. It says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Have you ever met someone at church and thought, oh no, they're not my sort of folk, and then had nothing more to do with them? I'm sure most of us at some time have felt like that. But have we missed out on a blessing? I want to tell you the story of one person who nearly missed Jesus because she thought the person who was there couldn't possibly be him. Just forget about me now as I tell the story as she would have told it. My name is Mary. I was born in the town of Magdala on the shore of Lake Galilee. It's about three miles from the big city of Tiberias. Magdala's a busy place. There's a lot of shipbuilding and fishing, but the main industry is the pickling and salting of herrings. Once, long before my time, there was a lighthouse in the lake near to the town. There's no trace of it now, only if there's a drought and the waters of the lake recede, and then you can see the foundations of that lighthouse. Magla, Magdala means Town of the Fish. I love Magdala. As a child, I would often go down to the shore and watch the fishermen mending their nets. Then I would go and watch the men building the boats. The men would chat to me and I'd always talk to them. As I grew older, the men often flirted with me and I was very flattered. Occasionally, one of the men would ask me to go for a walk with him and we would sometimes go up onto the Arbor Cliffs above the town. These men were men of the world and they taught me of quite a few things. I began to get a reputation and was never short of a bad friend. My parents became concerned, but I thought they were old-fashioned after all, you had to enjoy life to the full, and I was determined to do that. I soon found that my friends from the past didn't want to know me anymore, or I didn't care. Then my parents and my brothers and sisters began to ignore me, and I wasn't welcome in their homes. Did I worry? No, not at all. I could soon find a bed where I was welcome. 
life was exciting. I had lots of friends. We had fun. We drank until we didn't know what we were doing. And sex was a big thing in my life. I could get plenty of money that way. After a while, I don't know what triggered it off, but I didn't feel well in myself. I just felt things weren't right. So to counter that, I played even harder. I knew I looked a mess. And suddenly my so-called friends weren't very friendly anymore. I think I embarrassed them by the way I was behaving. No one wanted me in their homes anymore. And I was at my lowest ebb. One day, as I walked through the market, I heard people talking. Jesus of Nazareth is in town, they said. I wondered who on earth this man was. I asked folk. Some ignored me, but others told me he was a healer, a preacher, a teacher, and he called himself the Son of God. At first I was sceptical. But then I thought I had nothing to lose, so I went to the centre of the town. There was a huge crowd and I pushed my way through to the front. I wasn't popular. After all, I was unkempt and smelly. Not the sort of person you'd want to stand next to. Right in the centre, sitting on a market stall, was this man. He was talking to the people. We could hear the shouts of the market traders, but close to Jesus, there was silence as he spoke. I listened. He was talking about forgiveness, about changing our ways. He was telling folk that God had sent him to be the saviour of the people and to draw them closer to God. I hadn't thought about God since I was a teenager when I went to the synagogue with my parents. As I listened, I felt a change in my heart. I crept nearer. I knew I was dirty within that I needed cleansing. I knelt at Jesus' feet and started to weep. Suddenly I felt his hand helping me up. I looked up into his eyes. He spoke. Be free, my child. Something happened. My body and my mind felt lighter. I was free of whatever bad was inside me. I looked at myself for the first time in ages. I was still dirty outside, but inside I was clean. I tried to thank Jesus, but he told me to go, change my lifestyle and follow him. Please don't disappear, I said. No, he said, I'll always be here for you. Where could I go to get myself cleaned up? I ran to my parents' home. They were so surprised to see me. I must wash, I said. I've been made clean inside. Please help me. They listened to my story and were absolutely amazed. They had heard of Jesus, but they found it hard to believe the change in their daughter through this man. After that, I was determined to go wherever Jesus went. I had to encourage others to listen and change their lives. So I started on my journey. Wherever Jesus and his disciples went, I went too. But I wasn't the only woman. I got to know Joanna. She was a very wealthy woman whose husband was a treasurer to King Herod. She had been changed by Jesus too. Then there was Susanna, an ordinary lady, but willing to help Jesus in practical ways. And then, of course, there were other friends of Jesus too. I couldn't believe that here I was, a lady of the night, now mixing with a lady of the court and respectable people from the town who normally would have nothing to do with me. Of course, we didn't teach openly. But if people asked us questions, we were able to tell them exactly what had happened. In our way, we were serving our Lord, in a quiet way, in the background. We saw many th wonderful things happen during the time we were with Jesus, happy and sad. 
It was so good to see the miracles Jesus performed. But sad when we saw people deride him and ignore him, particularly the religious leaders of the day. Then things got really bad. The religious leaders got together. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. He, who was such a good man, who did such wonderful things. But the stumbling block was that he said he was the son of God. They couldn't take that. They were waiting for the Messiah, but they didn't think it could be a man like this. They wanted a Messiah who was going to overthrow the Romans, not a man of peace. Then, of course, there was the incident in the temple. You remember where Jesus found his father's house was being used as a trading place, and not an honest one either. I'd never seen Jesus like this before. He was so angry, but rightly so, of course. He turned over all the tables of those selling the animals for sacrifice. The money went everywhere and the animals fled into the streets. It was chaos. I was worried. I just knew there would be trouble. The priests were furious. We hadn't heard the end of this, I thought. It was Passover time and we women were going to celebrate with our families. But then we heard some disturbing news. Jesus had been arrested. I remember running to the place we often met. The other women in our group came too. Is it true, they asked? Has Jesus been taken before Pontius Pilate? Some other followers of Jesus came to tell us that Jesus was to be crucified. I couldn't believe it. Jesus was to die the death of a common traitor, a common criminal. No, it wasn't possible. What could we do? Some of us were frightened, but I said that we must go to be with him. When we got into the city, there were crowds of people everywhere, all shouting and making a terrible noise. We managed to push our way through and then we saw the three men carrying their crosses. One of them was Jesus. What a sight. He had this crown of thorns on his head and the thorns were sticking into him. The blood was pouring down his face. I couldn't bear it, but I knew I had to follow. Eventually, we arrived at the gates of the city. Just outside, there was a slight hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. The rocks made it look like a skull. It was not a nice place. The soldiers started the horrible task of crucifying the three men. The two others with Jesus were just common thieves. I couldn't watch, but I had to stay. The sounds of the hammers, the moans of the men, it was awful. We looked round for the other disciples, but couldn't see any of them. They weren't here. Lots of people were watching, but it appeared very few of Jesus' friends. Where were they? They should be here. We women clung together in tears. We surrounded Jesus' mother. We felt so much for her. Eventually, the crosses were in place. And then I saw John. He came over to where we were standing. He was very distressed. The scene was awful. Then Jesus spoke. He called John's name. John went forward. We clept quietly forward too. We had to be careful because we were women. It could have been dangerous for us. Then Jesus spoke again asking John to take care of his mother. He actually thought of others when he was suffering himself. We waited and then Jesus spoke again. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. How could God forgive them for killing his only son? 
one of the two men who were crucified with Jesus started to taunt, taunt him. The other man said, stop it. We deserve what we've got. This man doesn't. Then he just turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, please remember me when you get to your kingdom. Jesus looked at him and said, you will be with me in heaven today. He continued to care for others. It was the middle of the day and yet it started to get dark, very dark. We kept looking at the sky. Then Jesus spoke again, into your hands I commit my spirit. At that moment Jesus died. It was like night and we were really scared. A Roman officer was standing near us and we were so surprised to hear him say, surely this man was God's son. We couldn't believe it, but we didn't have time to think. The earth began to shake. Everyone threw themselves on the ground. It was an earthquake, but somehow not an ordinary one. We just knew that. It just felt as though God was speaking. Eventually, the earth stopped moving. And even though it was still dark, we stayed by the cross. Suddenly, some people came running out of the city. The curtain in of the temple has been torn in two from top to bottom, they shouted. The curtain in the temple, it was huge, it was enormous, it was 60 foot high and so thick. How could it have been torn from top to bottom? And then we knew God had opened the way for us. We stayed all afternoon. It got a bit lighter. We didn't know what else to do. We knew it was getting near the beginning of the Sabbath. Suddenly, there was a movement. A man we knew was Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had often talked to Jesus, approached the Roman officer and spoke to him. The officer went off. We didn't know where until later when we heard that he'd gone to speak to Pontius Pilate because Joseph wanted to bury Jesus' body before the Sabbath. When the officer returned, he got the soldiers to take down the body of Jesus and Joseph wrapped it in a white cloth. He carried it into a nearby garden, which belonged to him, and there he placed Jesus in the tomb. We followed him. And as we stood there, he said, this was to be my tomb, but Jesus needs it now. The soldiers came and placed a huge stone in the doorway of the, of the tomb and sealed it and then placed two men there as guards. We ladies spoke together. We had wanted to prepare Jesus' body after the Sabbath with spices and oils, but now it seemed that this was going to be so difficult. We went our different ways, arranging to meet on the day after Sabbath to see what we could do. Very early on that day, I met up with my friends and we made our way to the garden carrying oils and spices, though we had no idea if we could use them. We hurried through the quiet streets. Most people were still in bed or there were some getting up and getting ready for work, but they took no notice of us. We entered the garden, expecting to see the guards at the tomb entrance. But there was no one there, and the large stone was rolled back. We looked, and then saw a man in white sitting on the stone. We were scared. Don't be afraid, said the figure. I know you're looking for Jesus. He isn't here. He has risen just as he said he would. Look, the tube is empty. We tentatively crept forward and looked in. Jesus had gone, but the sheet that had covered Jesus' body was still there. That sheet was so neatly folded. Go and tell the friends of Jesus, this man said, and then he was gone. And we knew we had been talking to an angel. 
We ran, as you can imagine. When we arrived at the house where the disciples were gathering, they didn't believe us, but we insisted they come and see. Peter and John ran and we followed. We got some strange looks from the passers-by, especially as women don't usually run. When we reached the garden, Peter and John were looking into the tomb. Then they believed, although they still didn't really understand what had happened. The two disciples and the other woman, women left the garden, but I stayed on. I wanted to be here alone. I just felt nearer to Jesus. I turned away from the tomb and I saw a man. I didn't know who he was. He looked a bit untidy. And I thought, I don't know who this is. I don't want to have anything to do with him. And I turned my back on him and I wept because I didn't know where Jesus was. Suddenly, the man said to me, why are you crying? I didn't know, look up. I just said, I don't know where the body of my friend Jesus is. It's not in the tomb anymore. And I thought, I want this man to go away. I don't want to have to talk to him. And the tears continued to flow. Then a voice called my name. Mary. I couldn't believe it. I know that name. I looked up and through my tears I could see Jesus. Master, I said, I wanted to hold him. He said, no, please don't touch me. I haven't gone back to my father yet. Just go and tell all our friends that you have seen me and that I'm returning to my father. I didn't want to leave, but I knew I must. And again I, read, I ran, and again I told my story, and again I told them that I didn't believe it was Jesus. I almost missed him, but I knew when he called my name that it was him. We stayed together in the room that day, locked in that upper room that was so special to us. We were afraid that if the Romans knew the body of Jesus was gone, they would come and arrest us. We talked of nothing but Jesus. And then as evening fell, suddenly there he was in the room with us. Can you imagine? We didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Peace be with you, he said. And he showed us his nail prints. Oh, the joy, we felt so different. But he told us to wait and that we would receive the Holy Spirit. We weren't quite sure what that was, but we knew it would be wonderful. I could tell you so much more, but here I must stop. I have been blinded by my tears and I nearly miss Jesus. Do we sometimes miss Jesus? I'd like to finish with a story some years ago, a famous American folk singer called Lonzo Green went to visit his sister and her husband and their teenage son called Carl. While he was there, Carl explained that he had a friend who had been given a guitar, but he didn't know how to tune it. Would it be all right if he came over and he, Lonzo was able to help him tune it? Lonzo said he'd be delighted to. But Carl's mother said, is that the friend that lives over in that other part of town, in that poorer area? Yes, said Carl. Well, it's not coming in my house, she said. Lonzo was quite surprised at his sister's attitude. But he said to Carl, look, don't worry, bring him over. We'll sit in the garden and see what we can do. So Lonzo brought his friend over with his guitar and Lonzo taught him to, how to tune it, then taught him some chords, and then they sang together some very simple songs. The boy went home really happy, always remembering the kindness that he'd received from Carl's uncle. 
Some years later, Lonzo visited again. He asked Carl if he ever saw that friend that I helped with the guitar. Oh yes, regularly, said Carl. I didn't know you still saw him, said his mother. Well, said Carl, you see him and heard of him a lot too. What do you mean, said his mother. Well, said Carl, that boy from the other side of town, the wrong side of town, is now on this side of town. What's his name? said his mother. Carl said, his name is Elvis Presley. We have to be so careful how we deal with people. We can't judge people by how they look or where they live. Carl's mother missed the opportunity to be friends with Elvis Presley because she thought he came from the wrong side of the track. Mary nearly missed Jesus because she thought he was just an old gardener and it certainly wouldn't have been Jesus. She didn't expect to see him there in the garden. Have we missed Jesus? Just remember he can be there for us at any time, in any place. How sad it would be if during this year we miss spending time with him. When we hear Mary's story, we see what a wonderful change came into her life and we can have that change too. Just remember the words of Colossians. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Over all these things put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. I think Mary Magdala would have sung this song with great gusto, how the Lord changed her through the love of Jesus. We're going to sing, since Jesus came into my heart, and the first word, verse reads, what a wonderful change in my heart has been brought. I trust that each of us, as we sing those words, really mean them. Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins which were many are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart So happy since onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart
close this service today, let's join together in that well-known benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.